This is a video about some sexual motives that are related to early spring in southern Scandinavia. Uh, and one important holiday in this motif is uh, the 22nd of this month, February, uh, the day that is uh, sometimes called St. Peter's Chair or something like that. My name is uh, Rune Jane Rasmussen. I'm a historian of religion uh, from the universities of Uppsala and Copenhagen. You can patron support my work with applying cutting-edge anthropology to renew our knowledge of uh, Nordic history, religions and folklore. Um, now, we live in an age where sex is still somehow a prov kind of provocative and dangerous thing. Like, for instance, last year we uh, published the first version of the Nordic Animist and Runic Wall Calendar, and we wanted to display the wonderful and powerful and compelling tattoo art of uh, my close friend Uffe Bernd. But uh, we were actually criticized for the indiscretion and lack of prudence of uh, these images that showed human skin, well, in order to show tattoos, right? Um, some uh, said that that was really gay to have naked men hanging on the wall, and I don't know, perhaps it was a bit. <laughs> uh, others that it was totally sexist to have uh, naked women, which totally wasn't. Um, I mean, we didn't use any images that Facebook, you know, would, would have censored or anything like that. Now, uh, I was actually going to record this little video here about sex and spring and animism in my local church. Um, just as a little humoristic tip of the hat to the people who had trouble stomaching all this transgressively carnal, um, humanity, but the pastor showed up when I was recording and she was a super nice woman who actually didn't deserve having her uh, sacred space uh, made into the backdrop for my um, idiosyncr idiosyncrasies. So I changed the venue to this more neutral place here, Copenhagen. Um, there is a resilience towards uh, sex which is often uh, present somewhere in, in most culture that is shaped by Christianity. A religion where sex and religion sort of is believed to belong in diff distinct spheres. Uh, but from the animist perspective, sex is a very powerful way of creating relation. And creating relation is what animism is all about. And that's why sex plays a, a central role. Uh, animist religiosity has a lot of uh, sexual encounters between stuff like humans and animals, humans and deities, humans and spirits. Um, in fact, we're often uh, believed to descend from such encounters, um, an idea that's related to totemism. But when there's an interface between Christianity and uh, animist beliefs, sometimes it is as if the sex kind of spills over, or perhaps it was there kind of all along under the radar, I'm not even sure. Um, look at this here. It's the earliest crucifix found in Scandinavia, uh, where Jesus has an ornament here on his front uh, abdomen of his kilt thing and I'm not entirely sure if it's just my twisted mind that insists on seeing this ornament here as kind of sexually suggestive um, and uh, yeah another reason and uh, another thing was here the this here is the altarpiece in my local church which was the reason I wanted to record the the video there it's one of those rare little glimpses of the uh, <laughs> the savior's sexual life uh, I'm not kidding, that is the altarpiece in, in my local church. And I'm authentically not sure if it's there because the congregation aren't seeing it or because they're so sexually liberal that they, they think it's kind of cool. Um, so this is just to say that, that sexual motives are also there in Christianity. And, um, and this also, this also show, goes to show something about how the, uh, the spring animism um, flows through history in some so sort of dialogue with Christian motives, right? Cool. Sexual animism is an important element in the spring uh, tradition. And one Im important point is, is actually this day, St. Peter's Day, the 22nd of the month uh, called Goa month sometimes or February. Now, during the first months of the year, there are some very gendered and sometimes transgendered personifications going on. Uh, months are personified, and these personifications, they sometimes change and interchange. So the January period seems to have had a bit of a masculine bias. February seems to have had a bit more of a fem feminine bias. March, masculine. April, feminine. It is as if this gender tension is somehow necessary. And this is not consistent, of course. I mean, after 
April and both May is also feminine. And I don't, I'm not even sure that all the months are, uh, are gender in this way. January and February are definitely masculine and feminine in Scandinavia. Uh, but in England, both March and, and April are, are feminine. Uh, uh, God, they're actually goddess names, uh, Reda and Eustre, if I'm pronouncing this right. Uh, like February, particularly, is named uh, Goi or Goya or Goa and so on. Uh, and uh, this this m m second month of the year was seen as as a young woman in mythology, who was the brother of the first month. Um, and uh, they were both the children of, of a giant named Snow. Uh, in some traditions, some folkloric tradition, these traditions, these two are man and wife actually. So it's again, it's, it's differing, different traditions. So uh, the month of, of Goa was greeted by women uh, and uh, surrounded uh, by rituals made by women. Um, and then to watch here the 22nd uh, on, on this day or dates around it, then something happens. It is as if um, it's as if, the, it is as if the, uh, the year wants to shift back towards something masculine or, or to create a kind of a subtle sexual myth somehow. Um, tradition believes that there is some kind of celestial figure who throws hot stones into the water on this day to heat the water. So St. Peter, or sometimes St. Matthew, or... Uh, they, they, they are sometimes throwing stones in the water to break the power of winter, heat the water. And sometimes this breaking of winter is sticking a rod into the, into the earth, actually. And this breaking of winter takes place, uh, and there's been uh, many uh, speculations that it, it could have been associated with, um, with the uh, pre-Christian deities such as Thor, perhaps throwing thunderstones. There's an ancient, ancient tradition in Scandinavia of um, thunderstones, uh, and and um, I mean that is one of the, I think one of the craziest uh, cultural continuities that there are. I think uh, they find uh, thunderstones in, in Bronze Age graves, and uh, and people have been collecting them uh, probably into the 20th century. Um, so, uh, but but there are also other, but yeah, this might be, this might have something to do with this, or it might not. Uh, but there are also uh, attestations of this breaking of winter taking place around this time, associated with actual heathen figures. Uh, from present-day northern Germany, uh, the Frisians used to break the power of the, of winter by having pyres and dancing around pyres on this day, shouting "Vodka uh, tere" or "Voden chere," meaning. Odin devour, meaning, meaning that Odin devours winter, right? So this invocation or arrival of a celestial figure on February 22nd could be seen to have sort of its, its own sexual meaning um, in, in some way as sticking the stuff in, in the earth and maybe I'm going a little bit, it sounds a little bit far-fetched, but there are uh, spring rituals where you find these motives a little bit more where the, it's as if the sexual aspect is more um, explicit somehow uh, and there are examples actually where people have enacted this myth and thrown hot s stones in bodies of water uh, on this day sort of invoking this celestial masculine figure that uh, has something to do how, how somehow with uh, the waking up of spring in this feminine month of, of uh, Goa. Now, the interesting thing is what follows, because from, from uh, February uh, 22nd and, on, and um, onwards, uh, the, from the, it is as if this Goa, or Bleed month, that is called in southern Scandinavia, as if we are shifting back towards a masculine space in, in Thor month, or March. And it's been de debated what exactly this meaning, the meaning of this Thor in Thor month actually is. Some don't believe that it has anything to do with the uh, heathen god Thor. Um, I think it does, but it's a little bit of a longer debate. Uh, the Thor month, which in southern Scandinavia is located around March, has this strange uh, holiday, which is almost like a kind of advent, the coming of something. And this is called the Three Thursdays of Thor. Uh, and it is basically what it says, it's the three first Thursdays of Thor month. 
Now people uh, kept uh, uh, keeping the Thursday sacrosanct far in, into the modern era and you know it's difficult to know how far back this tradition extends but they, apparently they did see a link between Thursdays and Thor month. Uh, so these Thursdays are uh, in southern Scandinavia they're associated with the coming of cranes and there's an old kind of rhyme almost like a children rhyme that, that says in English it says on the first Thursday of Thor the crane treads the land of the Danes on the second she goes to the meadows and on the third she follows the farmer to bed now this crane or the crane apparently is a female figure and it follows the farmer to bed there's some sort of sexual suggestion going on there as well it also has association with light and so on and it's difficult to sort of you know make very strong statements about what all these things mean um, and these Thursdays of Thor here they they point towards what might be called the principal sexual holiday of the Christian mythology now you might say again like what Christians don't celebrate sex and yes they do you know, on March 25th the Annunciation Day or, or Lady Day Christians commemorate that God or the Holy Spirit had sex with the Virgin Mary and conceived uh, Jesus uh, who was then born nine months uh, later on, on Christmas Day now that day uh, is called in Scandinavian languages something along the lines of Vorfru Day now that's day and age, <laughs> the day of Our Lady. But in popular culture, this holiday name, it undergoes a subtle change. Vorfru Day becomes Vorfruns Day. It's probably difficult to hear the difference for an Anglophone, but what really happens is just a subtle change in the sound, and Our Lady becomes a completely different figure. It becomes a spring lady, Vorfru. Um, and this day happens to be located rather close to the uh, vernal equinox and that means that the day of the spring lady uh, was located f around the time of the heathen Disa thing that was celebrated in, in, in Uppsala and this was a period that was associated probably with some, some sort of goddess or goddesses, the Disa or the Disir. Uh, so the subtle change in this Christian name, uh, it is as if a kind of a animist cyclical logic is sort of hacking itself into the Christian mythology. There is a meeting going on between some sort of celestial, perhaps masculine figure and some sort of feminine sp spring goddess or something like that, that conceives, in fact, the new year somehow, which is going to be born on Christmas Eve next year. There's a, it, it's a very syncretic logic, which is which is which merges actually animist and Christian sexual uh, sexual imagery. Um, so um, yeah, so there, there are these notions of, of genderedness of the year and celestial beings and different sexual suggestions, uh, and uh, perhaps a, a kind of an arrival of a celestial being towards ma um, marriage with a feminine figure or something like that and this particular association particularly the association with Thor is interesting because thunder was considered uh, in, in, in Scandinavia to ripen the crops and um, there's actually something interesting going, going on with thunder between Scandinavia and Iceland because there isn't a lot of thunder in Iceland <laughs> I spoke to an Icelandic meteorologist about this there isn't a lot of thunder uh, but in Scandinavia there's a bit more and it happens during the spring and midsummer, high summer period, that's when it happens. Uh, and it was believed to uh, ripen the crops and the many personifications of thunder going on through the day, if, through the, uh, the ages. Different, uh, sometimes thunder is thought of as, a, as, a, as an old lady or sometimes people remember uh, Thor and call thunder Thor or the Thor man or something like that. Um, but, and there has also been speculations of uh, the goddess Sive, Thor's wife, that she could perhaps have been some sort of an agrarian goddess. Uh, so perhaps this 
meeting of a celestial figure in Thor month with a kind of a spring goddess it reflects, uh, or perhaps it makes sense to see it as a um, as a marriage between Thor and Thor and and, and Sif, basically. And I should emphasize here that when Norse gods are associated with folklore in this very associative way, then uh, these are speculations uh, about logics that may make sense somehow, it may give some perspective to what's going on. It's not an analytically strong historical proposition about what pre-Christian cult and belief was historically, because that's very far away, and projecting back through history in that way is very, methodologically is very problematic. Um, so, so this is more like an associative way of dialoguing and seeing, uh, seeing meaning in, in, the, um, in the cultural history. Um, okay, so here in early spring, it seems that these sexual motives, they are sort of there, but they're still just suggested somehow. And this is where you need to stay for the sequel uh, about uh, uh, sexual spring animism, for, because when we get a little bit further into spring, then these sexual aspects uh, or sexual ritual, they actually get quite a little bit more, or quite a bit more um, literal. In fact, they just become literal. Um, and uh, that was an attempt to make a cliffhanger. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and this kind of information is uh, what I'm trying to communicate in the uh, Nordic Animist Calendar project that can be either ordered or pre-ordered on pages immediately linked uh, around this video. And, um, it is a project uh, to make animist tradition uh, available to contemporary cultural activism and re-enchantment and reclaiming tradi traditional culture and so on. Um, you can Patreon support and share and subscribe to my YouTube channel and follow me on Facebook and Instagram and everything. <sighs> yeah, but also remember that, you know, the internet is basically shite. It's a shite world, this thing. It fragments our capacity to read books and have sex with real humans and be present for our kids and feel the wind and organize revolutions and all that kind of stuff, write poetry. Uh, I don't know where that came, come from, came from, but it came. Uh, great, see you around. Have a nice day.